Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. I want to welcome our special guest tonight, John Abrahams. John, buddy, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's cold as shit here, but hey, it's winter time, right? I um, hear you. Now, where are you coming from? I am just outside of Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia. Gotcha. Okay. I'm in New York City, so it's pretty cold here, too. Well, I'm a native New Yorker, so uh, I'm from Queens. And me as well. Oh, yeah. you are? Yes, sir. Awesome. Where in, where in New York? Uh, downtown Manhattan. Oh, damn. Yeah, I'm from Queens. I'm from the outer boroughs. Here uh, we go. So that's pretty cool, man. So thank you for being here. As I was telling you, you're probably going to be our, this is our last show of 2021, and we're going out with a bang. And uh, as we've been chatting over the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, you have a lot of fans out there. So when you're oh. out there and you're walking the streets, how often do you get recognized? You know, it depends where I am. And uh, it definitely happens. Like I was in a gap the other day making a return and I had a mask on and everything. And uh, I don't know if it's my voice or what, but, you know, the guy helping me was like at the end, he was like, hey, man, I, I really like your movies. Like, you know, um, I mean, I love it whenever it happens. But I remember when uh, when Scary Movie came out. I was living in Brooklyn at the time and uh, I was living in like a, you know, a pretty mixed neighborhood, but like heavy Latin contingency. And they were like big fans of scary movie. And like, you know, for the whole summer, every time I walked down the block, people would be like, yo, Bobby, it's Bobby. Oh, Bobby. What's up, Bobby? You know, like all the time. Well, I'm going to give you a big awesome. compliment. It's been 21 years since Scary Movie. It came out in 2000, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's been 21 years. Dude, you mm -hmm. don't look at, like a day has passed. Well, I'm rotten on the inside. Are you sure? Are you sure you're not like some kind of like immortal vampire or some shit like that? Uh, well, you know, I am a quarter Transylvanian for <laughs> real. God's honest truth. That's so, awesome. Uh, so it's possible I am a descendant of... Uh, you know, gypsy vampires or something. You have a career that spans over like 25 years. Uh, you've do you've dove into directing with like, let's see, All at Once, Clover, and Exploited. What yeah. was it that guided you towards directing? Has it always been a passion of yours? Um, it, it It's definitely always been, I think, what I wanted to do. Um, the acting door just opened first. I was like, you know, I, I was in film class in high school and uh, my dad made music videos when I was a kid, like sort of before MTV. And my dad was an editor and an animator. And so like, you know, uh, and then I have a family history, like my, my dad's uh, two uncles. One was Dean Martin's stunt double, and the other was like the Rat Pack's right hand guy. Ooh. And they were both best friends with George Raft before mm -hmm. that. So, you know, um, subsequently, my dad was like an extra in all these classic movies. My dad was like an extra in Planet of the Apes and like all these movies, and, you know, just always loved movies. And always took me to movies from a very young age and sort of explained the technicalities to me. Uh, so, you know, it always interested me, but um, I, uh, I wanted to do like monster effects. I was super into horror when I was a kid and uh, that's sort of what I thought my career path was going to be. Um, and uh, you know, I used to like, go to the horror cons and like follow Tom Savini around and go hit, go hear like Dick Miller speak. And, um, sorry, Dick Smith speak. No, Dick, Dick Smith. Yeah. yeah. Not Dick Miller. Yeah. Um, although I did meet Dick Miller once and he was awesome, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, you know, and I was super into that. And then, uh, you know, I just kind of continued in my interest in film and the acting door opened and I love that, but it's sort of a singular focus and, I come from a visual arts background and, you know, and a music background. And uh, I feel like directing sort of encompasses all my creative interests more. So um, you, you mentioned yeah. cons and growing up in New York like I did. 
before all these cons that are out now, which is just crazy, there used to be really Comic Con, which was mainly just about comics. And then you had Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors. And I used to go to Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors every year. And you got, and uh, that's where I first met Tom Savini. Is that where yep. you first got Same. to see him as well? Same. And like, I'm going to go back to like 89, probably wow. 88. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. remember, man, I love those Weekend of Horrors uh, with Fangoria because it was something unique. And you look back at all these cons and. Like I said, it was Comic Con and Fangoria that were really, you know, kind of the two big players. That's and, it. And they yeah. would travel around the country and whatnot. I remember in New York, it would be right across the street from Madison Square Garden at the Roosevelt Hotel. Yeah, it used to be the Pennsylvania Hotel. That's right. Sorry, the Pennsylvania. Yeah, Hotel. the Pennsylvania it. Hotel. Yep. Yep. And it's just one of my, you know, favorite memories growing up. Let's see, Clive Barker. Have yep. you ever had a chance yeah. to hear Clive Barker speak? At, at I those feel like I heard him speak at one of those cons, like back in the you know late eighties. But but I no, not recently. No, um, not recently. Me too. I mean, I haven't heard him speak recently either. But back at the cons, you see this nice, normal-looking guy take the stage, and then when he opens his mouth and start revealing all the sick, uh, creative yeah. stuff that he comes up with, it's just it blows you away. Yeah, I mean, I was like obsessed with Nightbreed, I yep. think, when it when it came out. And, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of like makeup, you know, creature makeup stuff in that movie. And, uh, you know, obviously I loved Hellraiser and, and all that stuff. So I was like super I think he did comic books, too, of yeah. Nightbreed. And I was like super into that. And um, yeah, I was always obsessed with Clive Barker. I think he's a genius. Yeah, uh, I'm glad yeah. I, had, I at least got the opportunity to hear him speak because it really is fascinating. I've mentioned that many times before on this show, but until you actually hear the man talk about what brings out the creative side in him, you, yeah. you can't describe it any other way. Now, you've done a lot of uh, independent films and, and whatnot. Are you drawn to independent films? Do you have a big uh, love in your heart for the indie film uh, scene? You know, it's just sort of how I how I came up. I um I started my acting career in indies, and back in the '90s, like you know, if you were a New York actor, there was just no you know stopping. Yeah, uh, no, right. you know, there was no end to indie films, and like you know, you could just kind of continuously work. Um, so yeah you know i mean I, i've been lucky enough to work in studio films as well um i've made my first three films as a director independently and you know there are pluses to it um money is not one of them That's but uh, <laughs> but um but you know but freedom it kind of is you know i think you you kind of maintain more of a voice and more of your creative freedom when the film is smaller and smaller and smaller you know having gone through the studio films and the independent films as an actor you know auditioning for both i would assume the studio films and the the amount of callbacks you have to do is insane compared to an independent film it is i mean uh, uh, the the kind of like tension field is on those studio films i kind of always am expecting to get fired <laughs> <laughs> and on indies i'm not like i'm kind of like okay like i have my place like they don't have money to replace me you know whatever but you know you're because when it's a studio context it's like there's so many cooks and there's so many executives and everything has to be kind of you know dotted and the t's have to be crossed and everything is micromanaged down to the most minute details it's a bureaucracy. Um, you know, there's, there's yeah. a whole committee that has to weigh in on stuff um and uh and you know that's nerve-wracking and it definitely makes you feel like you know your job security is at stake um you know independent films are small and sort of more of a family and you know it's scrappy and it's you know it's kind of that vibe so um but that's to say you know it is amazing being in studio films because of the power behind the distribution of them oh, yeah. you know and and all that they put into you know p and a and all that stuff so you know like that's just amazing and next level like if you're in a movie the studio film and 
you know, Lord willing, that movie is uh, does well its opening weekend at the box office. It's just insane. Like your phone just rings off the hook. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's wild. It's just really wild. And the reach is wild. You know, I mean, I don't I don't make mo my movies for money. Uh, I make them in the hopes that they'll have a reach. And, um, you know, that's that's harder and harder with indie films, I think, to really get a reach out there you know um and is it studios. because of uh, so much content out there now or is it uh i do yeah i think it i think it is i think you know i think it's sort of twofold i think um you know this the age of digital cinema and all that stuff is kind of wonderful because it sort of levels the playing field in the sense that anybody can kind of make a great film and if they have the you know the following they can get, you know, they could post the film on YouTube and they could get 10 million views, you know, and if you equated that to money, right, like that would be more money than a box office star was making for a film its yeah. opening weekend. So, you know, there's that, but, but, um, but at the same time, um, yes, there's just so much of it and there's so much to sift through and it's hard for anybody you know, I think I heard Quentin Tarantino talking about this the other day on like a podcast, like, you know, there's just so much content that it's, it's impossible to sift through it. You know, back in the day, there was three television stations and there was, you know, only so much television to watch. So, you know, you really honed in on things and it was sort of, sort of similar with films. I mean, studio films, when I was coming up, every studio used to make like 30 movies a year. Mm hmm you know and now they make five yeah. so it's like it's like you know less and less work for actors in that realm and you know all that kind of stuff so it's twofold i i i'm hoping that um that somehow it sort of like meets in the middle at some point you and know? and also don't forget i mean we have to also remember the amount of streaming services out there and you see that uh kind of starting to take shape with these mergers and acquisitions mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. example discovery is merging with warner media uh right. everybody's right. buying because there's just too many subscription services out there and people are not going to, even if it's for a free trial, pay $5 here a month, $9 here, 15 Netflix is $15 uh, dollars a month. Yeah. It just adds yeah. up. It's too much. So you're starting to see all these, you know, mergers, big studios getting together. Are you opposed to that? Are you a fan of that? Do you like more competition? What are your thoughts? Uh, this is a good question. Um it's difficult. You know, uh, it's difficult. I, yeah, I'm not opposed to it. My hope would just be that, like, they would make more content if they merged and, you know, maybe on a, like, on a scale, right? Like, it, it used to be that, you know, studios made, like, five blockbusters, ten romantic comedies, you know, ten whatever smaller films. You know, there was like a, you know, everything from a $10 million budget to a $80 million mm -hmm. budget. And, you know, it's just not the case anymore. So my hope would be that, like, if that happens, that they sort of start making, not just acquiring, but making, uh, you know, Exactly. A smaller scale of films, yeah. Yeah, and also yeah. start investing uh, in distributing independent films. Uh, you got to also wonder, with these mergers and acquisitions, Are you mentioned earlier that we're sort of on a level playing field. If they're trying to make it not a level playing field, and that is going to take away from, from some really great independent films mm -hmm. that have come out or have yet to come out, yet to be made... So do you see a like a conundrum there with these studios getting together that might hurt the independent film industry? Um, I don't know that it could hurt it more than it already is hurt in a way. And, you know, I don't know how to describe that except to say when I was making indie movies in the 90s, right, the average indie budget was like three million dollars, you know, OK? Now the 
average indie budget i'm gonna say is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars yeah absolutely um you know so and and what that what what ends up happening is is you have people trying to make studio films box office blockbuster kind of films on you know a one percent of the budget uh-huh. or ten percent of the budget and um you know that's just i think kind of messes things up and they do that because that's all that these distribution companies can sell mm-hmm. you know it, it so it sort of starts to take away from the independent film having a specific voice or taking chances or you know not making your typical kind of formulaic stories yeah. you know um and so that's something that I think is missing. You know, it, it becomes harder and harder to find. So, you know, I don't know. Um, I always like the dimension kind of films, uh-huh. you know, versus Miramax plan of like, you know, dimension made all the genre movies, which made all the money and those financed Miramax's art films. Yeah. You know, and I don't see the studios doing that, right? Mm. Like, they, I don't really see that. It's like you have everything's individualized now. Like, Shutter makes, you know, does the horror sort of release stuff, or there's horror distribution companies, and you know, it's tricky. You know, I mean, there is like stuff like Lionsgate, and there are like subsidiaries of studios that that do genre, but um. Well, that's, but yeah, it's, that's you know. interesting that you mentioned that because if you pick any, uh, you know, like Shutter, for example, if you follow the chain of ownership on a lot of these companies, it always ends up almost landing to a big studio, you know? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, right. It can, you know, it can. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't see currently... I, and I could be wrong. I don't really look at like the numbers. I'm not a business film guy so much, but um, you know, I don't see a lot of the studio genre horror films, you know, in in mass. I don't see them making a lot of money. Uh, you know, yeah. like Get Out does, and you know, whatever. But like, I feel like there's a lot of other ones that they make that don't seem to, you know. It's, go anywhere or go as far as far as some of the indie horror films that are being made out there mm-hmm. like you know um you know like what those guys who made terrifier were able to do uh you know i mean there's just like those things are amazing like the following is crazy and the you know the business is crazy so it's amazing it really is amazing and there's so much horror coming out now because it's yeah. cheap to make it really right. is cheap to make uh you can get it on there and i've had a lot of people uh who are sitting where you are now tell me that the best form of of marketing is word of mouth yeah i think so i mean i think so and i think like you know i'm a big john cassavetes fan and you know i've read about how they used to make the films and like him and peter falk would drive cross country and book the films in theaters Mm -hmm. themselves you know, um, and I think like if you're willing to do that legwork, that pays off. Like if you do a college tour or you, you know, if it's a horror thing, you go to cons and you premiere your festival. I mean, you're, you premiere your film at the at the con, you yeah. know, at the convention. Like, you know, yeah, I think in a sense you kind of have to do that and you build up this fan base and this following. And, you know, it's amazing what you can do without a studio. In exactly. That sense. Um, exactly. Um, whereas yeah so that, that's yeah. what i like about where we are today and the industry as a whole is in a state of transition we don't know where it's going to end up we see them trying new stuff like these early releases uh same day as theater 19 dollars rentals uh that you uh-huh. can rent so they're trying sure. different stuff and we don't know where it's going to end up where it's what's going to end up sticking or not sticking so let's talk about some of your movies uh, sure. scary movie of course you're very well known for scary movie now being a horror fan i'm assuming you knew all about scream before you did scary movie correct uh yeah so it had, you know it had just come out uh, maybe the year before a couple of years before and i know what you did last summer had come out and um you know, a, a scary movie was originally called Scream. If you know what I did last summer, no, 
Scream if you know what I did last Halloween. That's a, um, that's a pretty good title. You know, it was coming <laughs> off of the Wayans doing Don't Drink Your Juice in the Hood while being a menace to society. <laughs> um, um, and uh, so we were very aware when we made the film and, you know, like the Wayans are great because they are sort of much more collaborative with actors mm -hmm. uh, and writers than, uh, you know, some things are by the time you get to production. So they kind of like, you know, gave us all, you know, Scream and I know what you did last summer and copies of all that stuff and uh, had us watch it and, you know, oh, this would be funny to spoof and this would be funny to spoof. And, you know, they let us name our characters. And so like I named my character Bobby Prince Jr., you know, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, it was Prince like, a, you know, I'm supposed to be a combination of Skeet Ulrich uh -huh. and, as Billy in Scream, I think. And, yep. you know, um, yeah, so, uh, Freddie so yeah, Prince Jr. <laughs> yeah, we terrible. were totally aware of those. And, um, you know, those movies are great and they're almost parodies themselves. I think, like, Wes Craven, yeah. you know, even sort of always describe scream as being a parody it is. Film. so yeah so you know it's aware of itself and everything so um so yeah so you know we were totally aware of all those movies and 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 stuff you're absolutely correct and i was going to mention that as well i mean scream in itself uh because of the mentions in the movie of horror movies and what killers do and how it all plays out and endings that are going to have a sequel and not a sequel like you said, it is sort of a parody in itself. And then the Wayans come along and do Scary Movie, which was very successful. So how did you get the role of of Bobby? Did, how many auditions did you have to go through? How did it all come to you? Well, so um, I was a huge Wayans Brothers fan. Uh, you know, In Living Color was like everything when I was in junior high school. And... Um, they made a movie called I'm going to get you sucker, which was like yeah, my favorite right. movie. I loved that movie. I was like obsessed with like a lot of the black cinema, black exploitation films. And, you know, that's, that's a sort of parody satire of those films. And I love them. Um, you know, they were like my heroes. Uh, and I was making a movie called Texas Rangers for, for dimension. Um, and they were trying to cast scream. If you know what I did last Halloween, and they couldn't get anybody to do it. Like, I think like, you know, the likes of like Jared Leto turned it down. Like everybody was turning it down, like, you know, and they sort of like, I was in another film for Miramax called Outside Providence. And so they really liked my role in that. And they sort of cornered me on set and were like, hey, we're making this movie with the Wayans brothers and like, you should do it you know and i was like it was like literally like these exact sort of backed me into a corner you should do it would you do it you know and i was like the wayans brothers like hell yeah, yeah. like i'll do it you know of course say no more like sign me up and so they were like okay we're gonna fly you to la and meet with keenan and i met with keenan in his office and we like you know just kind of talked for a while and i you know i was like so starstruck and uh we kind of messed around in my memory. I think we messed around with like, you know, maybe a little improv stuff, although I can't remember if I like actually read for him or not. And, um, and then, yeah, they, they were like, you, you know, you got the part if you want it. And I was like, that's Great. awesome. Now, yeah. when, when you got to filming and Bobby, what was it that, uh, you know, it's obviously a movie, it's a spoof movie. What did you want to do? Uh, did you want to mirror the, character you were spoofing and scream and just take it to a completely like silly level did you want to try and do something different with the character what were your thoughts on how you were going to portray him it, it's sort of um it's sort of both because you know it's like you you are you are directly parodying <laughs> um you know specific scenes or moments from those movies but also it's you have to put a kind of specific eye on um you know who those characters are and like what their backgrounds are and then you want to heighten those things so you know it's like oh uh, 
Skeet Ulrich's character is kind of white trash, right? So it's like, okay, what, you know, then what are those things, right? Like what would the white, this, you know, the heightened white trash version be? Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, and then you start thinking about wardrobe stuff and, and you know, little shtick off that, like he lives in a trailer at school and, you know, has like 18 uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters that live in the trailer with him, you know, those kinds of things. So there's both there's like let's watch these specific moments from these movies and let's try and mirror them in a funny way and then also let's like go into the kind of private lives of those characters and see what we can pull out of there you know working with the weigh-ins did you find that they were very uh open to the actor suggestions and letting them do what they do yeah um yes they're amazing that way it is not often the case um they're so collaborative and yeah they they had us like we all met and we had some rehearsal time which is rare on studio films um it's rare on films in general and they gave us like questionnaires to fill out you know and they were things like you know what is your character's name and what does your character want in life and what you know like all these things and you know we filled them all out and then we handed them in and you know, then I think the writers and that, you know, they looked at them and sort of like, we're like, oh, this is funny, you know, because you answered them as your character. And, you know, I think the hot dog thing, the hot dog scene, I think I came up with that in like a rehearsal or in, you know, so it was kind of like you could pitch ideas yeah. and then, you know, if they thought they were funny, they would end up in the film, you know, and they would try them out. Was this your first dive into doing comedy or had you had previous experience? I had had previous experience um, because I think at that point I had done Outside Providence, Mm -hmm. um, which uh, which is a film I love. And uh, that's a sort of dramedy. But I was the the, you know, the um, the fool in the film, if you will. So, uh, yeah, I had had some experience doing that and then had had some experience like in the improv, you know, world before. So yeah you know i had had some comedic experience it wasn't all just dramatic so several years after a scary movie you got a part in house of wax uh another successful film what was that experience like not a comedy or a spoof whatsoever no not at all um so that was awesome for me because like i said i was a big horror movie fanatic when i was a kid and There's a theater in New York City called the Film Forum. Mm -hmm. It's been around forever. It's a great art house theater. And when I was a kid um, in the summers, they would do a whole like 50s B movie and 50s A movie horror movie festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would show like all the William Castle films with all the gimmicks like, you know, 13 ghosts. And like they would have the ghosts fly across the audience during the movie and the tingler and they would have the seat vibrate when the tingler came on screen, you know, all those things that like William Castle did as gimmicks to get people to see the films, um, which I love. And uh, so House of Wax, right, is one of them, right? It was in 3D, the original, and mm-hmm. I had seen it a couple times. And so when that came around, I was just super excited by that, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, that was just awesome because being on a big budget horror film is 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 amazing it's amazing because like you know props and production design and all that stuff like they spare no expense so you know you're you're in these like i think we had three fully dressed sound stages in australia for house of wax um you know and and all the sets were built and dressed and ready to go at all times as well as they built that entire town, that like little Louisiana town. Yeah. They built that entire town in the middle of the jungle in Australia. Damn. Like, man. you know, and you could walk around in that town and <laughs> you could go into the church and there's like, you know, there's all these wax people in the church and, you know, it was wild. So being in a, you know, and coming from my background and my interest as a kid in that side of horror movies and stuff, it just was amazing, you know? I mean, it is a remake. The original had Vincent Price. Uh, yep. Do you have any trepidation in doing reboots or remakes of films and thinking that they're going to fall flat? Audiences who are 
faithful to the original i'm not gonna like it what are your thoughts sure. on doing remakes? i mean i am one of those people i i never liked the remakes of texas chainsaw i never liked the remakes of and i don't i hope i don't offend anybody but you know i just didn't like them I, no, I it's your opinion yeah, yeah you know when 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 like there was that era in the early aughts of remaking all the major horror franchises that ever were you know um i just wasn't I just didn't think they were doing a good job. I thought that making William Castle films from the fifties uh, on this sort of grand scale and updating them, those I thought kind of worked for the most part, you know, yeah. um, just because like, technically speaking, if you watch any of those like ghost ship or, uh, you know, house on haunted Hill, I think they remade and house of wax. And yeah. there's a few others that, that, Joel Silver did with his company, um, Dark Castle, which were like, you know, I thought they were pretty great. I thought they were good updates. I thought they kind of like took a lot of that stuff and, and you know, made something new of it well. Whereas the like music video versions of Texas Chainsaw and, you know, uh, um, Friday the 13th, maybe there was one like that, that they yeah. read Nightmare on Elm Street, mm -hmm. you know, like, they're just not, they don't work for me. And I think maybe part of that is that the originals are made on a shoestring budget and they're, they're raw. They're mm -hmm. more raw. And that's what makes them scary to me, you know? Um, and those slasher films like, you know, Nightmare, Friday, of course, Halloween, Michael is back in the thick of things. Halloween Kills just came out. Yeah. There's another one coming out next, uh, next year. Do you think time plays an issue as well? Like with House of Wax, it was a significant amount of time between the original and the remake. Uh, do you think if, sure. if enough time passes, uh, it, you know, it's good to reboot a franchise? It is. I mean, it is. But then again, you know, I think it's, it's happening a lot now, which is that like there's really not a lot of new projects. Everything is sort of an updated version of something that was mm -hmm. um and you know that's a little tiresome to me. you know i don't see a lot of new voices or new takes on stories you know it's all sort of the reboot of this franchise the reboot of that franchise again again and again you know and the time in between that one and the new it's one shrinking. is getting shrinking yeah i mean i forget there's something they're like remaking now which just came out 10 years ago or something it's like as a filmmaker yourself, uh, what is it that you want to do moving forward? Uh, you, are, you know, you said you're obviously a horror fan. Do you yeah. feel like, uh, obviously, let's put the reboots, remakes aside. Uh, do you have some pretty good ideas uh, uh, as a director? Do you know a lot of writers? Do you do some writing of your own uh, and are you've got some really great ideas that you want to actually put on the screen. Yeah. I mean, I definitely do. I think you're always kind of kicking ideas around your head. Um, my first two films all at once and Clover were written by one of my best friends, Mike Testone. And, you know, we have other projects that we've, you know, been kicking around for a long time. Um, and I'm developing a, a movie right now, but I'm not really a writer yet um i can break story really well uh but you know the heavy lifting it's not something i ever really like leaned into so i have a bit of like fear around jumping in as a writer and uh you know i think it really is just that it's just like some silly fear you know or trepidations and uh once i jump into it i think i'll 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 love it and be off and running but um, but I love breaking story and I love conceptualizing story. And uh, yeah, you know, I think my interests are very varied. Um, I really want to. Yeah, it can be. You know, I think it also can be tricky for uh, industry people or executives to, you know, to figure someone out like yeah. myself because, you know, they want someone who's sort of like, no, this is my direction and this is it, you know, and when you're like, no, I like this, but I also like this and I also like that. They're kind of like, oh, we don't know what box to put you in. 
you know, um, it can, it can, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced that for sure. Um, so I just like to try as much as I can out. Um, I love dramedies. I think everything I've made with the exception of maybe exploited, but all at once and Clover, even, you know, they're both dramedies. They both are dramas with a lighter side yeah, at times. So, exactly. um, and, um, you know, my favorite horror film is Return of the Living Dead. Uh, always was. And I think it's a terrifying film because it's funny, scary mm -hmm. and funny, scary, like scary movie at times, like scary movie has some really violent, scary moments yeah. within it. You know, um, you know, there's just something about that. It's like something about what your brain can't fixate on what it is. And, you know, in a business sense, people will say, oh, that's not really good for business. But like, on an emotional level or, you know, a somatic level, it's terrifying. And it's you know, it's like you. totally yeah. stirring. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, I think overall, like my interests are to keep kind of exploring the dramedy or the, what I call crime comedy, crimedy zone or the, you know, horror comedy zone and so on and so on and so on. Return of the Living Dead is a classic. It will, it just, you know, it's just one of the, like you said, one of the greatest movies out there. I mean, it was I original so, yeah. and it was lighthearted when it needed to be. It was scary when it needed to be. And it had all the elements. Before we go, we got to talk about your role as Denny and Meet the Parents. You know, one of sure. your most well-known roles. Big film, De Niro, uh, Ben Stiller. What was that experience like? Uh, it was amazing. Um, you know... I grew up across the street from Robert De Niro. Oh man. And, you know, I, before I even knew kind of how amazing he was as an actor, I knew that this, like, I'd see him, you know, on the block or whatever. And I'm, this guy's got something, you know, I was always sort of enamored and um, it just was, and I also grew up in a neighborhood that's like, it wasn't, there wasn't many people there. So it's odd to have grown up across the street from him. And, um, you know, obviously you look up to someone like that if you're an actor, right? You're just like, that's the, that's I mean, a that god. That's Robert an acting De Niro, god. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so when that happened, uh, it was just like, you know, I remember when they called and said, like, you got the part. I was like, literally my feet were off the ground, you know, I was floating. And you then, got to work with the guy that you've admired and grew up watching and living across totally, the street from. You know, yeah, totally. And I, I think that probably helped get me the job because like De Niro's always the final boss. Yeah, he vouched you for you. You know he vouched for He's the for final you. boss. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, you got you get through everybody else. You got to get through him. And so I met with him in, in our neighborhood and, uh, you know, he was sort of shocked that like somebody could be from that neighborhood and uh and uh i think that probably helped get me the job as his son um and it was just an amazing experience i mean it's like you know i think when we made scary movie we were all psyched to be there and we all were having so much fun but you didn't really know if we had no idea that the movie was going to be what it is mm -hmm. you know and, and and you know that when it came out it was the highest grossing r-rated film of all time was it and really r-rated Yep. It was. I, I did not know that. Highest grossing R-rated film of all time and the highest grossing black film, I think, of all time, which was like a big deal, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we didn't know that when we were making it. I'll Meet the Parents, it was different. You kind of knew like, oh, this is, you know, it's just you're sitting there and you're like, this is going to be a classic. Like you could just tell. And it is, you know, it's it's like it's it's almost a holiday film right like huh. that people still watch around thanksgiving and you know it's just so beloved by like a wide range of people and it yeah. shows like de niro's range of talent i mean he can do you know play uh the Corleone Godfather in Godfather 2, the younger version and he can do comedy he can do whatever he wants and he's great at it yeah, he's amazing. Uh, he's an amazing comedic actor, really. You know, I mean, King but of that's comedy. not what he's really known for, though. No, it's not. But if you look back at his canon, you know, there's a lot of comedy. There there's is. a lot of comedy. You know, King of Comedy is one of my favorite films ever, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, there's so much. So, um, 
I don't know. I, I always say that like comedians make the best dramatic actors, but I might one up that and say dramatic actors make better comedic actors. I don't know. You know, I think that's the case with Bob for sure. Like he's oh, yeah. just, yeah. I mean, he's so yeah. fun to watch no matter what. And, no matter uh, what he does. Absolutely. Yeah. John, this has been fascinating. Uh, thank you so much. Is there any thank stuff you. that you're currently working on that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, I'm developing a movie right now, um, which hopefully we'll make in 2022. Nice. Uh, but I'm not going to say the title yet, no, just because no. I don't like to curse things. Um, uh, but Exploited is uh, in the process of being sold. So look out for that in 2022. And that's a horror thriller set in the webcam fetish world. Uh, and it's uh, actually one of the only that I know of um, LGBTQ plus protagonist kind of horror thrillers. You know, wow. I think you haven't you haven't seen that yet. And uh, that was a kind of interesting zone to work in so absolutely are you uh coming on any more conventions in the near future oh i would love to so all the cons out there John get out there now let's out go there. let's go i, I would love it I you love, love doing going out there and intermixing with your fans the crowd getting to feel that energy it's amazing and like i said i used to be the fan at those cons and you know like so I still am when I go, I still walk around. I'm like, Ooh, look at that. You know, who, you know, I'll get like this guy's autograph or whatever. It's, you know, I still totally geek out for that stuff. Absolutely. Me too. Me too. Yeah. John, thank you so much. It's been thank you. fascinating uh, talking with you. I want to thank all of our viewers. I want to wish you a Merry uh, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy Hanukkah. Uh, we're probably, this is probably our last show till 2022. So Everyone have safe uh, holidays. Enjoy your time with friends and family. For you too as well, John, thank you for coming on our show the day before Christmas Eve. Thank uh, you so much. So until next year, guys, stay safe. And on behalf of John Abrahams and myself, stay walking. Bye, everybody. Happy New Year, y'all. Happy Be safe. New Year. Many blessings.